go ahead and open in prayer, and then we will jump into tonight's lesson. God, as we uh, seek to understand your word better, as we uh, traverse it and, and dig into it, we pray that we do it justice and we we, uh, we represent who you are and your word properly. We thank you for those who are here and for those who cannot. We pray for their safety, their well-being. We pray that we always show grace and mercy to all. Thank you for tonight's lesson and help us to learn well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Matthew. We're in the Matthew uh, 26, 27, 28 area, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. This is the final narrative portion of the, of the book of Matthew. Um, this is going to be a little bit different lesson. I kind of uh, alluded to it last time in dealing with um, the, the, the text. I got into a uh, kind of a dig um, and with Judas and with Peter. And so uh, we're going to be looking at specifically the contrast between Peter and Judas. So this is going to be somewhat review because we're going to look at Peter and Judas um, and their kind of history, and then take a look at the text in Matthew 26 and 27, and kind of just look at it and, and just understand how it's written and how it's contrasted. All right. So first of all, for three and a half years, Jesus has traveled, ministered, and taught, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. For three and a half years, the disciples, later called the apostles, followed Jesus. After Jesus' baptism... Jesus was identified by John the baptizer that Jesus is the Messiah. We find that in John chapter 1, 29 through, 30, uh, through 34, where it says the next day he saw Jesus coming and said to him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. So first and foremost... We, we need to make sure that we understand that the first initiation of Jesus was a declaration by John. Now, John had his disciples. And so from the very first of this instance right here, going on to the next verse, we see Jesus beginning to accumulate disciples now that he is manifested or shown, uh, illuminated, demonstrated that he is the, he is the Christ. In verse 35, again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked in Jesus, at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Now, one thing I want to make sure we understand, that this following Jesus is simply literally following Jesus. It has, I think it has a little bit different connotation in the book of Matthew. So John, he just basically, they just followed. And Jesus turned and saw them following, kind of like, Kind of like that, that kind of apprehensive following, like this is just kind of looking at him. What says, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him, that is Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translates means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now, it's important, though, that this is not where Jesus calls Peter to follow him. This is not where he begins his disciples, um, you know, kind of the commissioning of, of, the, of the disciples. We see that more specifically in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They, they've already met by this point, okay? So in this situation, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has already met Andrew and Peter and kind of already discovered he's the Messiah. So it's not like just some stranger coming by going, all right. Drop your nets, come follow me. They go, 
I don't know who you are, but okay, it sounds good. No, they already have an introduction to Jesus. He said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Again, I, I the indication is not everything's written for uh, for all knowledge, but we have information that we need for us under, to have understanding that this is not the first instance. So this is where we see Jesus begin us, uh, uh, accumulating disciples for himself, specifically calling out individuals. So, as after that introduction, we're going to look at Matthew 27, 1 through 10, contrasting Peter and Judas. First, let's take a good look at Peter. We've already kind of alluded to that in dealing with his calling. Now, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 2, the disciples are mentioned. Peter is called the first. Was he the first one called? Well, if you take the concept in John that Andrew first followed Peter, then Andrew was the first one to follow Jesus. But again, that following may be completely different. The word first in Matthew chapter 10 is not about the order of calling. Rather, it's about primacy. In other words, who's going to be the leader? When he says, Peter, the first. He's going to be the leader. So Peter is the leader of the apostles and the pillar, along with John and James. James, not the brother of John, but rather the half-brother of Jesus. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Paul went down basically to get Peter's permission to be, to go out and, and give the gospel. Now, when you get to Luke, and Luke will add a little bit more flavor to Peter's calling, give him, giving more details. So in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, bear with the, the length here. Now, it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he got in the, 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 the boats which ones was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Now, again, all indications is what? He's already met Peter at this point. So this is kind of a greater detail of the Matthew account in Matthew chapter 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out to the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answers that, Master, we worked hard all night and caught in nothing. Now, why do they go out at night? Because that's prime fishing catch time. During the day, it is not. So because it gets a little warmer, fish go down a little deeper for the cold. But I'll do as you say and lay down the nets. When they had let down this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and the nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners, the other boat, for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats. So they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet. What did that fall down at? What do you think that indicates? Falling down at Jesus' feet. That is what? That is worship. At the moment of the calling, he understood something. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He understood nearly immediately that he's dealing with something other than simply a man. I think that gets developed, and obviously his words in Matthew 16 run, run prominent. For amazement has seized him and all his companions because of the catch of the fish which had been taken, and so were James and John, the son of Zebedee. Again, this is not they're, they're not just a simple walk by, follow me. This is they're having interaction here. And Jesus said to, to Simon, Do not fear, for now on you'll be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So Matthew truncates the information greatly. Luke gives a little bit more detail, but we also understand from John that this is not their first meeting. So Peter was in his boat when Jesus came and spoke to the people and told Peter to cast his net, and they caught a large catch. And then Peter makes that very astute observation, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He understood, at least in part, 
who he was dealing with. Peter gets it quite early. It's one of the reasons why he's called Cephas, not just Simon, because he's the rock. And it's his statements that are kind of the are built upon. And he had becomes the de facto leader of the 12. So Peter was told that Jesus was the Messiah, but it does not appear that Peter became his disciple immediately. Later, after Jesus demonstrated who he was in the miracle, Peter humbled himself before Jesus, and Jesus gave him his first commission, along with Andrew, James, and John, follow me. Then we get to the 12. So once again, in the first year of Jesus' ministry, now it's hard to get the exact chronology of this, uh, of this down, but it appears for about the first year, Jesus went all over Galilee and Israel, proclaiming the truth and performing miracles. How long did it take before he started accumulating Peter and John and, and, and Andrew and, 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 uh, and, and James? Um, don't know. Could have been within the first week. Could have been within the first month. It's, it's, we really can't know for certain. But we do know that it was per, probably pretty early. However, this first season of Jesus, captured in Matthew chapter 4, 23 through 25, it doesn't seem like everyone is with him quite yet. Jesus was going throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demonics, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So, trying to read everything and getting it all encompassed from the synoptics and John, it appears that during the first days, only the initial six were with Jesus. Now, the other six was Philip and Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel also called Bartholomew. So these six were very prominent early on based upon the readings of all four Gospels put together. That's only half of the Apostles. After that, they, they started walking around all the Jeru all around Galilee. Then all of a sudden, they started getting huge numbers of people following them. Some people number that based upon this, the language in the thousands. It, it might have even have been a hundreds. Maybe thousands were listening, and as Jesus would move along, hundreds would follow him. But regardless, it's a large number of disciples followed Jesus. It is from that group, because we don't have any information about the call of uh, of Thomas, Thaddeus, that is Judas and James, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, we have no record of their calling. Now, we do have Matthew, who was at a tax booth. Matthew and James are probably brothers. Thomas, which is called a twin, don't know if he actually has a twin, but that's just kind of a name, and Thaddeus, which is also called Judas and James, and Simon the Zealot are all just added to their numbers at some point. The assumption that I make looking at the text is that they're part of that group. And he called them out of the crowds. Hey, you guys, you guys are going to be my inner 12 is the, 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 the leaders of, of, the, of the group. And obviously from those 12, he has an inner circle. Three to be precise, Peter, James, and John. This brings us to Judas. Now, like the latter four, Judas Iscariot was probably selected from the crowd who was following Jesus during that first year of ministry. How long did it take for him to get all 12 together? Again, your guess is as good as mine. I do believe it's within the first year, but it could have been two months. It could have been six months. We don't really know. And dealing with Judas himself, there is a lot we don't know. Um, and here's a question that I asked and just kind of trying to understand Judas's situation, his betrayal, and also his reaction afterwards. Was Judas sincere early on and become corrupt? Or was he an opportunist and simply looking for money from the beginning? Well, 
when you go into the text, I think we can get, I think, a suitable answer to this question. In John chapter 6, 64 through 71, it says, but there are some of you who do not believe. Now, this is to the entire group of disciples. We're, we're, based upon the text, hundreds, if not thousands of people were following Jesus, and Jesus is speaking to them, going, there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. So just because you're following Jesus around, listening to the message and seeing miracles, doesn't mean you're believing who he is and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no man can come to me unless he has been granted to him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered for the group, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him, of which he knew from the beginning which one was going to betray him from the beginning. Now, is this just pre-knowledge? Well, let's take a look at another passage. John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box he used to pilfer what was put into it. Hmm. What about John 17, 12? Again, where we talked about this before. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you had given me, and I guarded them. And none of them perished but the son of perdition, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. So the, the, the one statement, the first verse we looked at in John 6 Judas was a devil. The word devil is the word diablos. It's the same exact word that is used for the devil. It's an adjective that means slanderous or false accuser. Now, looking at all this information, that calling Judas a devil, calling him the son of perdition, looking at it from uh, all the different verses, seeing that Jesus knew from the beginning who would betray him, choosing him out specifically for that purpose is the indication. I am convinced that Judas was a betrayer from the beginning and was probably a corrupt businessman or a simple thief who lived his life trying to look for opportunities to steal. He was given the opportunity as one of the 12 to control the money box. And what did he do? Opportunity, opportunity, and he stole so, in looking at this situation with Judas, you know, uh, we have different questions about the sincerity, about this, and, and, and we don't get direct answers from this, but I think you take into consideration all that is written about him in all the Gospels, specifically in the book of John, where it's mentioned directly. I, I do think that, that Judas was a corrupt person from the beginning, and he was allowed to join the Twelve, Jesus knowing exactly who he was. Now, let's take a look at the betrayal. Betrayal and denial. First, Judas betrayed Jesus. Now we're going to look at some passages and just make some observations from Matthew chapter 26. So if you want to turn there, Matthew 26 is where we've been, and we're going to obviously be reading into Matthew 27. Um, but we're going to bounce it around a bit because we're going to look at Judas, and then we're going to look at Peter. So Matthew 26, 14, then one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? Does that sound like somebody who is, you know, kind of planning a, a deception to try to, you know, get Jesus to reveal himself? I mean, if, if you're, I've heard it before saying that Judas was trying to force Jesus's hand so that he would become king. 
In fact, some movies actually depict that. Does that look like a person who is trying to kind of force Jesus' hand to reveal himself truly as a Messiah? Or is he greedy? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, it's interesting because in Luke, he basically says, um, looking for an opportunity to do so uh, kind of like underhandedly. Very interesting. In Matthew 26, 24, he says, the Son of Man is to go just as it is written to him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Right afterwards, it says, and Judas, who was betraying him, said, surely it's not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, you said it yourself. I know what you're doing. And he is warning him. Beware. It's better if you do this. It's better if you have not ever been born. Now, we took a look at that phrase when we dealt with this. And it's probably more of an idiom than it is an actual statement. But I found it very interesting looking at this, that Jesus is directly speaking to Judas and giving him a solid warning. Again, very, very interesting that a man who was intending to betray has already gone to the priest, already set up this deal, was being found out and known by Jesus. I know it's you that he would go through with it if he was well-intended but deceived or just, you know, kind of well-intended but corrupt. He went through with it anyway. In 2647, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, and this is a sign of affection, he is the one sees him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now this is also interesting because um, later on in John 18, 3, it says that Judas was what Judas received a cohort that so we talked about that last week when we realized that it's upwards of 800, possibly 800, upwards to a thousand people that went with Judas to surround the area to make sure they get him this time. Remember, he's escaped uh, various different crowds before. Maybe Judas realized that and said, I need a large crowd to make sure we get him. Judas was given the cohort, and he was given the officers, and he led them to Jesus. That's the betrayal. Now, Peter, on the other hand, denied knowing Jesus. But let's go ahead and review the lead up to that situation. Matthew 26, 31. So we're still all in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, we talked about Judas. Now we're going to talk about Peter. Matthew 26, verse 31. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fail or fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before the rooster crows, You will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Now, Jesus obviously knew what Peter would do, but we talked about it before. Is Peter insincere? There's no indication of that. He was insisting that he would not deny Jesus and was willing to die. In in, in verse 57 to 58, uh, chapter 26, 57 through 58, After Jesus' arrest, those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance. After the initial flight, you know, remember, they had to walk back through the city. 
from Gethsemane over to the Caiaphas' house, Annas' house, it's, it's not a hard follow, you know. <laughs> they just, he just has to follow him there. Remember, John was with him too. John, who was known by one of the, one of the, the servants, was allowed to let Peter in kind of covertly so he can watch at a distance. So we see Peter initially comes back to the chief priest's house to observe the trial, probably trying to prove his courage, standing up to the situation, not denying him. But then what happens? In verse 67, we see the denial. And they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. And others slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is the one who hit you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied, denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you are two or one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. Peter reacted in fear. Remember? And we talked about it last time. Unprepared for the moment. He thought he was strong. He had to come to terms with his weakness. We had to come to understanding that he was actually an unprepared person in dealing with the actual face of, of, of uh, imprisonment and death. Remember, it wasn't but less than two months later that he actually was put in prison several times and beaten and left glorifying God. So here we have two contrasts in what they did. Now, a lot of people like to compare what Judas and Peter did. Well, Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. Both are horrible. And I would agree. Peter's denial was horrible. But was it the same? Well, no. Judas planned it from the beginning, was intending to betray Jesus from the beginning, always looking for opportunities to steal and to take money. Peter was sincere understood who Jesus, who Jesus was, and was ready to do anything except for the fact we don't, we never really know how we're going to react in times of extreme pressure. So no, their activities in denial and betrayal are not the same, although both bad. Now, getting into the response gets even more interesting. See, Peter's response was one of shame and sorrow. Remember, we read from Luke chapter 22, 60 through 62. Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Have you ever had that look from your parents? Just that, man, I, I this right here, if there's ever a, a, a simple sentence in scripture that kind of gets that little gut wrench on me it's that look right there knowing what you just did and having jesus look at you and peter remembered right in that moment the word of the lord how he told him before a rooster crows today you will deny me three times and he went out and wept bitterly in the gospels this is the last time we hear about Peter until after the resurrection. There's during the crucifixion of Christ, during the three days, nothing. You hear zero. It's only after the resurrection that you hear about Peter again, running to the tomb. It's the first time we hear about Peter again. In Matthew 26, 75, it basically says the same thing. And I just want to make sure we said, and he went out and wept bitterly the exact same language that Luke writes. And that's very interesting because that word for bitterly is the only time it's ever used in the New Testament, and it's used in both spots, Matthew and in Luke. So it got me curious, what does this wept bitterly mean? 
Well, the word wept is pretty typical. Wept is the word clio. It means to weep, to cry, to bewail, to which I had to look up the word bewail. Does that mean to, to really wail? And literally, that's if, if you ever see anybody in, in kind of like the, uh, the, the Middle Eastern traditions, it literally kind of means to beat the chest and lament loudly. This is that agonizing, you hitting yourself, punishing yourself, hitting your, and just, it's a self-torture because of lamentation, because of sadness. That's bad enough, but then you throw the word bitterly on top of that, and that's uh, picross. I don't know why I put a P there. Picross. Pertaining to feeling mental agony, and it's the only time that this word is used in the New Testament. Now, there's other cognates for this, but this particular adverb is only reserved for Peter's wailing. Mm. Now, a, a scenario comes to mind, and that was the, the wailing of the man in black. Everyone, yeah, thank you, thank you. Everyone can hear it. I have a feeling that based upon those two words put together like this, that Peter's remorse was beyond anything that we can fully understand. A scream of agony and sadness. What was Judas's response? Judas's response was one of remorse. Now, let's go ahead and read this, since that's our actual text. It's Matthew 27. We'll take a look at all 10 verses, 1 through 10. Next time we meet, I'll probably go through some of this information again. But again, we're, we're focusing on the contrast between Judas and Peter. And this is going a little faster than I anticipated. Now, when morning came, all the chief priests and all, all the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned. So where was Judas the entire time? He went with them. It's not like he just delivered him and took his 30 pieces of silver and went on a vacation. He went to the high priest's house to see what, how it would happen. He felt remorse. And returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elder saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it is the price of blood. The hypocrisy of the chief priest, I think, is absolutely amazing. But they conferred together and with the money bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which has been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, and they took 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel. And they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. So a fulfillment of prophecy. So when you read this, now it's very interesting because the account of Judas's uh, reconfrontation with the chief priests and his suicide, and his the, the the statement of his remorse is only captured in Matthew. It's not in Mark. It's not in Luke. It's not in John. Only in Acts chapter one recounts that Judas killed himself. We'll talk about that when we get to Acts, okay? And, and when we're in there, because is there's a all people see there's a, 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 a conflict of information between Acts and Matthew. But only there does it recount that he's dead and that they bought the field with the money that he was originally given to betray him. Not the confrontation and not the remorse. Only this section of scripture tells us what happens. Okay? So, when Judas saw that Jesus was content, condemned, he felt remorse. Now, first and foremost... The word condemned is important. The word condemned here is kata krino. Kata krino, a cognate of the word krino, which means to judge or determine or distinguish, 
Katakrino is a very specific word. It means to be found guilty and have a sentence declared. If you look at this throughout the New Testament, it either means to be damned or to be sentenced to death. This isn't like, oh, you were you were, you, you did something bad. It, it's not that's it, found guilty of sin. That's not what it means. It means to have a sentence of death or to be damned attached to you. So Judas kind of woke up and said, wow, my greed, my money, the, the, what I desire it overcame me. And I just turned over somebody who I know has not sinned. Okay, Judas was with Jesus for three and a half years. Now, we, again, we can talk about what Judas did and what, Ju what Judas was planning all this time. But Judas obviously knows that Jesus is not some type of rebel. He knows he is not some type of, you know, uh, uh, some type of faker. He's seen what Jesus can do. He hears the message of Jesus. He doesn't believe in him. But he does know he is innocent of condemnation. We don't know what he was intending. We don't know if that was a, a, truly a shock to him. All we know is that when he saw it, he felt remorse. He knows he's going to get killed now. Remorse is the word meta, uh, meta, meleomai, meta, meleomai. And it means to have regrets about something in the sense that one wishes it can be undone. I would wish I am sorrowful. I am regretful that I, I, I betrayed him. However, the word is not the same as metanoia. Metanoia is the word we see for repent, which you know how I feel about the translation of the word repent. But metanoia is the word that is used for Israel to prepare for the Messiah and the kingdom. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Now in those days, John, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, when he said, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. After Judas was taken into custody, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But remember... He kept on telling his disciples, shh, don't tell anybody, I am the Messiah. He was taking on the responsibility of the message, but kind of keeping his Messiahship on the down low, okay? And only when it was his time was he revealing himself. It's one of the reasons why he tells his mother, woman, it's not my time. Why are you asking me to do this? And so he, again, went to the back. And only one person knew that he turned the water into wine. Maybe two people. And just to make sure we understand this repentance, this metanoia, Acts 19, 4. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, metanoia, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is Jesus. So this preparation, this was the message of, of Jesus. This was the message of, of John the baptizer. So, Judas often gets equated to having that repentance. They say, oh, so even though Judas killed himself, he repented. That's not true. Judas's regret did not lead him to a change of mind. There's nothing in the text that indicates that. Judas did not seek to reconcile. He went and confronted the Pharisees, the chief priests. But he did not seek to reconcile to God and to Jesus. There is no indication that Judas then believed in Jesus. Instead, he went away and hanged himself. So I'm not trying to get on a soapbox about the nature and character of Judas. I'm trying to get you to see the difference between Judas and Peter. So understanding that, the contrast between Peter and in Matthew 26, 75, and Judas in Matthew 27, 5 is clear. What does it say? Got to turn back there. 
2675. He went out and wept bitterly, wailed with beatings of chest, fully contrite and sad. That word went out is a form of erikamai. Erikamai means to go, okay? Down in 27.5, it says that he departed. He went away. He went away and hanged himself. That word went away is a form of erikamai. So an ek erikamai and an op erikamai basically means nearly the same thing. They got out of there. They left where they were and went off to a distant location. They left the crowds. They left behind where they were and went somewhere else. Peter wept bitterly for his sorrow. Judas went away and hanged himself. Now, I'm not saying that the, the, the emotional lamenting is what made this real. What I'm saying is you can see the distinction very clearly in five verses between Judas and Peter. Peter's remorse, now I'm going to back this up in just a second, resulted in Peter's restoration. Judas's remorse resulted in shame, despair, and death. Now, why do I say resulted in Peter's restoration? Well, we know he was restored. There's nothing, there's not, a, there's not a verse in the Bible that says he is restored, by the way. Now, a lot of people like to go back to John chapter 21, John, John chapter 20, where they're at the, the sea. Do you love me? You know that I love you. And he asked three times. That's to make up for the three times he denied him. There's nothing in the text that would indicate that. He's already appeared to, to Peter several times before that. This is a different scenario because you're not doing what you're commissioned to do. Why are you fishing when you should be fishing for men? Okay. So we want to make sure that we understand and back up Peter's restoration. What do I, why do I say that? And I would say, when was Peter restored? Again, it's, uh, it's not in the lakeside event, do you love me situation. Okay. First and foremost, when Peter saw the empty tomb, he was still in a state of disbelief, fear, and sadness. How do I know that? Well, John chapter 20 beginning in verse 6 says, And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, that would be John, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. It does, Notice it doesn't say Peter, or they saw and believed. Okay. For as yet, they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. Now, okay, I find that very fascinating because Peter's still not okay, it looks like. It's my, it's my impression. However, if you read between the lines a little bit, I'm going to I'm, I'm theorizing here a little bit because I want to, I want you to see what I see. I think there's an indication that between the tomb, this instance right here, and the situation with Jesus appearing to the to the to the uh, apostles when he shows them his hands on his side, that there was an interaction between Jesus and Peter. What I have in my notes is Jesus and Peter had a talk. Going to Luke 24. Now, if you want to, we're going to read a good portion of Luke 24. If you want to turn there, you can go ahead and follow along if you have your own Bibles. So once again, premise, there's an indication that between the tomb and the appearance in the room with the other apostles, Jesus and Peter had a talk. Luke 24, verse 8. Now, this is um, the women... Jesus appearing to them. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to the rest. So there's other disciples that were with them. The eleven, who's there? Peter, obviously, we know that that, that happens. Now, they were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. Also, other women were, were with them telling these things to the apostles. 
But these words appeared to them as nonsense. And they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. And behold, now this comes up in the next section. This is the road to Emmaus. And behold, two of them were going that day to a village named Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. They're walking along. And who, who joins them? Jesus, okay, but conceals himself from their recognition. Is that supernatural or is it just the fact that they hear like maybe we're in a something? In verse 22, they reported to Jesus, some women among us amazed us. So they're part of the disciples, but not part of the 12, the 11. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they'd also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. Jesus then cuts into to this story and he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses, with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Go down a little farther to verse 31. Then their eyes were open, they were breaking bread, and they recognized him. We're with Jesus. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to, to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Now, this is the first indication in Luke or in any of the Gospels, that before that upper room where he appears to the uh, to everyone, that he appeared to Simon. Simon, okay, just follow me for a second. Returning to his home, I don't know where Jesus met up with him. But before that evening, when they were all gathered together again, Jesus went and talked to Simon. It had a little heart to heart. Perhaps at his house, because both John and Luke state that after the tomb, Peter went home. Then the next place you find them is with the 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 5. Have you caught this before? For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then the twelve. He appeared to Peter first. Now, when I did my introduction to James, I also mentioned later on, too, that he also appeared to James. Because I think James, his half-brother, and him had a little heart-to-heart -heart after he was risen from the dead. And he was commissioned also to remain on in, in Israel and Jerusalem to kind of lead that group as well. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Does that work? I have a little button here. Oh, it does. That's so cool. I can add a, I, I can add next verse button down here. So he then appeared to 500. So basically he's giving a t an order of events. So my theory, theory, because I can't prove it, but based upon the fact that he did speak to Peter, I believe on the initial visit before appearing to the apostles, Jesus and Peter have a heart to talk, heart to heart, heart have a heart to heart, and Jesus forgives Peter. Now, what's the main desire to do from this? We read 
a historical account about Peter and Judas. One remorseful to the point of restoration, the other one remorseful to the point of, of suicide. By the way, that might get us a strike on YouTube. They don't like the, they don't like that word. What's the difference? It's history. Is there anything for us to learn from this? Oh, to be remorseful like Peter was, not remorseful like, like Judas was. There's, there's no lesson here. What I find interesting is that Peter, though, sought and still remained with the 11. He didn't go remorse and then disappear. Judas went out. And of course, again, he was evil. It's not a perdition. So you can't say, well, as a Christian, this is a good example. But he went and left and went by himself and went and hung himself. If I had to say there's an application that if you ever feel like you've let people down, you've ever feel like you let God down, don't go be by yourself. Go and talk to people you trust. I think that would be the only way you can kind of deal with this kind of remorse situation. But there's not a, there's not a true lesson here for what we need to do. We are simply looking at the content. We're looking at the history and just fascinated at the grace of God and how he restored Peter in the face of the second worst event that night, other than the betrayal. We'll pray, and then we have a few minutes. So if you all want to stick around and ask some questions about this, I've, I've given this a lot of thought, so I hope that... Uh, it helps you out in kind of understanding the difference. But we'll go ahead and pray, and then we'll uh, we'll pick it up next week. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we're allowed to, to, to dig into this, connect the dots a little bit, and uh, try to get an in indication about the character and the and the and the attitudes of Peter. And what a, what a great example he has! Someone who failed multiple times, but at the end, because of your word and him focusing in on it was not only restored to his position, but also the fact that he became very instrumental in what we understand and believe to be true. We thank you for him. We thank you for, you, for your grace and truth to him. We thank you for your grace and truth to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.